Uh, colleagues and friends, let me welcome you to the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. My name is Peter Lowen. I'm the director of the Monk School, and it's my pleasure today to welcome you here for this uh, very important speech by our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Melanie Jolie. Um, I'm going to uh, do two things. One is to uh, properly and rightfully acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. This has been for thousands of years the traditional home of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And we're very grateful to be able to live and to work and to join each other here on this part of Turtle Island. The second thing I want to do is I want to introduce the person who's going to introduce uh, uh, the minister, a very good friend of the Monk School uh, and a very distinguished Canadian, Lisa DeWild. Uh, is the Vice Chair of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, is the Bell Media Professor of Media Management at the Schulich School of Business at York University, and she is, uh, as important as all those things, uh, a very proud and effective Canadian who wants Canada to project itself onto the world stage uh, as best it can. So Lisa, it's my honour to welcome you to the podium. Thank you, Peter, for that very generous introduction. And thank you to the Monk School of Global Affairs for co-hosting today's meeting with Minister Jolie as she prepares for a multilateral set of meetings in Asia in the coming days. Minister, it is truly wonderful to see you again. Au nom de notre président du conseil, l'honorable Pierre Pettigrew, il me fait grand plaisir de vous accueillir ce matin. Please allow me also to thank you on behalf of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada for the tireless work that you do to advance Canada's interests and values in a world facing increasingly complex threats and issues, and for leading Canada's contribution to addressing global challenges, including by deepening our partnerships in regions of strategic importance, such as the Indo-Pacific region. The Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada is a not-for-profit organization that was created by an act of the Canadian Parliament nearly 40 years ago. It's headquartered in Vancouver with a small office here in Toronto. I'm very proud of how the foundation works to strengthen Canada's trans-Pacific ties. The foundation makes its research and analysis publicly accessible in policy advice, in business intelligence, and in a really cool publication called Asia Watch that is our weekly analytical take on news and events in the Asia Pacific region. The foundation also convenes high-level councils and networks to help bring Canadian stakeholders closer to their counterparts across the Asia-Pacific region. The foundation is Canada's secretariat for the APEC Business Advisory Council, and I'm especially proud of CanWin, which is the Canadian Women's International Network. It provides Canadian women who are expanding their companies into Asia a powerful network of connections, and ongoing advocacy and support. CanWin is built on relationships that are created through the Foundation's women-only business missions to Asia, which over the last three and a half years have included in-person, hybrid, and virtual business missions to Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand, and India. And under the leadership of the Foundation's Christine Nakamura, the second Canadian women-only business mission to Japan, will focus on healthcare and clean technologies and is set to take place next month. The Foundation also convenes the annual Asia Business Leaders Advisory Council. It has a wonderful acronym, which I swore not to use. A high-level group of Asian and Canadian business leaders that meets annually to identify opportunities to improve Canada-Asia business engagement. It will meet in Singapore in February. It's going to be the group's first in-person meeting since 2019. And I'm delighted that Goldie Hyder, who is the President and CEO of the Business Council of Canada, he is the chair of the Singapore meeting, and he's here today. So thank you, Goldie. And speaking of Singapore, the Foundation is very excited about our newest initiative in partnership with Universities Canada, the inaugural Canada in Asia Conference. In early 2023, in Singapore, this conference will engage over 30 Canadian universities and over 500 participants, including the Asia-based alumni of many Canadian universities, as well as key leaders from Canada and Asia in business, academia, and government. So you'll be hearing more about the Singapore conference in the coming weeks. This is just a sneak peek. 
All of which brings me to the purpose of our gathering this morning, and that is to hear from and to engage in dialogue with the Honourable Melanie Jolie, Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs. Minister Jolie was first elected to represent Ahuntsic Cartierville in the House of Commons in 2015. She has since served as the Minister of Economic Development, the Minister of Tourism, Official Languages and La Francophonie, and Minister of Canadian Heritage. In her ministerial roles, Minister Jolie has worked to promote Canadian culture, to grow and increase the vis visibility of Canadian tourism. She has also worked to safeguard Canada's official languages while promoting the use of French in Canada and around the world, including in the digital sphere. Prior, in, prior to entering federal politics, Minister Jolie founded La Vraie Changement pour Montréal Party and ran for mayor of Montreal in 2013 under its banner. Minister Jolie holds an Honours Bachelor of Law from l'Université de Montréal and a, master, a Magister Juris in European and Comparative Law from the University of Oxford. She's the author of Changing the Rules of the Game, in which she shares her vision for public policy and civic engagement. She was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. Ministre, nous sommes ravis que vous joindre avec nous pour ceux qui promettent d'être une conversation très importante. Please join me in welcoming Minister Jolie. Thank you, Lisa. It's always a pleasure to see you. Uh, we've worked in the past together, and I'm glad that we're working again together. Um, and also, thank you to the Asia Pacific Foundation. Say hi to Pierre for me. Looking forward to seeing him soon. Um, and also, thank you to the Hmong School. I know also there's Christine from the Asia Pacific Foundation that work extremely hard to gather a lot of people here. So first, thank you for uh, answering uh, Christine's calls. <laughs> thank you on a short notice. And thank you, Christine, also for all the work. And so I'm really happy to be with all of you today in Toronto. Um, speaking to you before, like Lisa was mentioning, before I leave uh, with the Prime Minister for the Indo-Pacific region. We will be participating in different summits in the region, particularly the ASEAN Summit in Cambodia, the G20 Summit in Indonesia, and the Prime Minister will also attend the APEC Economic Leaders Meeting in Thailand. Expanding our partnerships with countries in this region and deepening our economic ties is critical. How we intend to do that will be laid out in our forthcoming Indo-Pacific strategy. I'm pleased to say that the full funded strategy will be launched within a month. Acting in Canada's national interest without compromising our values will be the central tenet. I look forward to discussing the detail, details with you then, but for today, I would like to outline some of what we can expect. Donc, merci à l'Université de Toronto, merci encore à Lisa, merci pour ton incroyable français aussi. Um, et puis aujourd'hui, mon but, c'est de vous parler un peu de la stratégie Indo-Pacifique qui s'en vient, particulièrement avant que le Premier ministre et moi-même uh, allions vers uh, différents forums qui auront lieu en Asie, que ce soit celui de l'ANAS, du G20 ou encore celui de l'APEC. Il est essentiel de développer nos partenariats avec les pays de la région et d'y approfondir nos liens économiques. La manière dont nous comptons y parvenir sera élaborée dans notre prochaine stratégie Indo-Pacifique. Before we dive in, I know that we have all been following what is going, out, going on south of our border. I'd like to say that Canada's relationship with the United States has stood the test of time. We have a proven history of working together, no matter who holds the Congress, the Senate, or the White House. That tradition will carry on today. I'm grateful for the excellent relationship that I've been able to develop with my American counterpart, Tony Blinken, who is now, I would say, a friend, who was just in Canada two weeks ago. The Secretary of State and I have frank and open discussions, and by doing so, we've been able to further align our approaches on the issues that affect the health, the security, and the prosperity of citizens on both sides of the border. This includes on major geopolitical questions 
the pandemic, Ukraine, of course, Iran, Haiti, and now the Indo-Pacific. Avant de discuter de la stratégie Indo-Pacifique, j'aimerais discuter brièvement des élections de mi-mandat au sud de notre frontière. La relation avec les États-Unis et le Canada a toujours su résister l'épreuve du temps. Et nous avons toujours su travailler ensemble, peu importe qui siège au Congrès, au Sénat ou encore à la Maison-Blanche. Je suis d'ailleurs très reconnaissante d'avoir une excellente relation avec le secrétaire d'État, Tony Blinken, avec qui j'ai eu de franches discussions. Et cela nous permet d'enligner nos approches sur des enjeux qui affectent la sécurité, la santé et la prospérité des citoyens des deux côtés de notre frontière. Et nous sommes également alignés sur plusieurs questions géopolitiques majeures, sur lesquelles nous avons plusieurs conversations, que ce soit la pandémie, l'Ukraine, l'Iran, Haïti et aujourd'hui maintenant l'Indo-Pacifique. We all know it. All of us feel it. We are at a critical moment in time. We may have been lulled into believing that the international system was more or less guaranteed. As long as we stuck together, we're our friends. If we just held on, we could weather the storm. Yet, if there's one thing that 2022 has shown is that the tectonic plates of the world's power structures are moving. In this evolving global context, the status quo is not an option. Canada ought to be clear about how we intend not just to engage, but to lead. To do so, we must deepen our existing friendship, like with Japan and South Korea. And we also need to seek new allies. We need to engage even when we disagree. We must show the world the very best of what Canada has to offer, diversify our diplomatic networks, and be a stronger force for positive change. Showcasing Canada as a reliable partner for the region. This is what our Indo-Pacific strategy will be about. The Indo-Pacific region is the epicenter of a generational global shift. It is the fastest growing economic region of the world, responsible for almost two-thirds of global growth over the last several years. By 2030, it will be home to two-thirds of the global middle class. And by 2040, which is less than two decades from now, the region will account for more than half of the global economy, more than twice the share of the United States. At the same time, greater power competition is deepening in the region. Interstate tensions, many with historical roots, are flaring or re-emerging. Critically, the global fight against climate change cannot be won without the support of Indo-Pacific countries. Every issue that matters to Canadians, our national security, economic prosperity, democratic values, public health, the quality of our environment, the rights of women and, uh, and girls, human rights, will be shaped by the relationship Canada and its partners have with Indo-Pacific countries. To put it plainly, the decisions made in the region will impact Canadian lives for generations. We must be at the table, step up our game, and increase our influence. I know the question on everyone's mind is how we will account for China, which sits at the heart of the region. Our approach to China will be outlined in the strategy, for which, of course, we can't have an Indo-Pacific strategy without it. In 1970, Pierre Elliott Trudeau demonstrated international leadership by extending a hand to establish diplomatic relationships with China, despite our different systems of government. The reason was simple, and the rationally widely shared. The community of nations could not sustainably isolate one-fifth of humanity from its international institutions. Dialogue, as challenging as it was, had to prevail over ignorance and fear. While there are strong people to people ties remain, the China of 1970 is not the China of today. 
China is an increasingly disruptive global power. It seeks to shape the global environment into one that is more permissive for interests and values that increasingly depart from ours. And China's rise as a global actor is reshaping the strategic outlook of every state in the region, including Canada. Canada will never apologize for its national interests, and we won't be sorry for seeking to uphold the global rules that govern trade, human rights, or navigation and overflight rights. La Chine est une puissance mondiale qui bouleverse de plus en plus l'ordre international. Elle cherche à façonner l'environnement mondial de manière à ce qu'il soit plus permissif pour des intérêts et des valeurs qui s'éloignent de plus en plus des nôtres. L'ascension de la Chine en tant qu'acteur qu mondial modifie la perspective stratégique de tous les États de la région, y compris le Canada. Le Canada ne s'excusera jamais de défendre ses intérêts nationaux, ni de faire respecter les règles qui assurent la paix et la stabilité à travers le monde. We will continue to engage at the highest levels regarding the human rights situation in the Xinjiang region in China, where credible accounts of human rights abuses and crimes against humanity are well documented. We will continue to oppose unilateral actions that threaten the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. We will deepen our economic ties with Taiwan. We will continue to stand up for freedom of speech and freedom of the, of the press in Hong Kong. And in multilateral forums, we will act in concert with partners to face the complex realities of China's impact on the world stage while pushing back against behaviors that undermine international norms. As we forge ahead with a strong, multi-dimensional approach to China, we'll always differentiate between the actions of the Chinese government and of the Chinese people. We will, chi we will challenge China when we ought to, and we will cooperate with China when we must. Its sheer size and influence makes cooperation necessary to address the world's existential pressures such as global health, nuclear non-proliferation, climate change and biodiversity loss. This is why Montreal, my hometown, will be the host um, of the world, will be hosting the world for the UN Conference on Biodiversity, COP15, this December under a Chinese presidency. With up to one million species currently at risk of extinction, the world cannot afford to wait any longer for global action on nature protection. At all times, we will continue to have frank, open, and respectful dialogue. We'll not hold back from sharing our concerns, our principles, our positions, and our values. What I would like to say to Canadians doing business in and with China, you need to be clear-eyed. The decision you take as business people are your own. As Canada's top diplomat, my job is to tell you that there are geopolitical risks linked to doing business with the country. We will, along with the Minister of Trade, my colleague and friend, Mary Ng, help you diversify and mitigate risks across the region. We'll also be adding a new national economic security lens on foreign investments in Canada, including in the critical mineral sector, as highlighted by my colleagues, Minister of Industry, François-Philippe Champagne, and also my colleague, Minister of Natural Resources, Jonathan Wilkinson. In the words of Lester B. Pearson, how can there be peace without people understanding each other? And how can this be if they don't know each other? That is why I'm announcing today that we are investing in deepening our understanding of how China thinks, operates, and plans, how it exerts influence in the region and around the world. Key embassies across our network will have dedicated experts 
to deepen our understanding of the challenges that China poses and the opportunities that it pursues. That will become a focus of our diplomatic effort. Donc, j'annonce aujourd'hui que nous allons investir davantage dans notre compréhension de la façon dont la Chine réfléchit, opère et planifie, dans la façon dont elle exerce son influence dans la région et dans le monde. Nous n'investissons pas seulement dans notre ministère à Ottawa, mais également les ambassades clés de notre réseau vont disposer davantage d'experts dédiés à la compréhension des défis que pose la Chine et des opportunités qu'elle recherche. Cela deviendra un point central de notre effort diplomatique. As we consider the rising influence of China, we must also take into account the remarkable trajectory of India, the world's largest democracy. As India becomes the most populous country in the world, its leadership and influence will only continue to grow both in the region and globally. With it, so will the opportunity for Canada, including the economic opportunity for Canadian businesses. India is looking to expand its commercial relationships in the energy, food and technology sectors, all areas of Canadian strength. Canada and India also have deep and enduring people-to-people -people ties. Canadians with family connections to India and Indians who now call Canada home in richer communities, companies, cultural institutions, and this very campus. In fact, India is the largest global source of international students coming to Canada. We will look for new opportunities to invest in connecting our people, and we will continue to build on our existing partnership to the benefit of citizens in both of our countries based on a commitment to democracy and human rights, common interests in the free, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific, and collective efforts to address global challenges. Both of these approaches, when it comes to China and India, will be outlined in the strategy document and found throughout what you will see are five objectives. The first objective, commits Canada to promoting peace and security in the region and, in turn, the world. The second will focus on trade, investment and supply chain resilience. The third one, we will invest in people, development and the defense of human rights in the region. We will also share our world-class expertise to support the fight against climate change and, finally, we will answer the call from partners for greater engagement by expanding our regional relationships. La stratégie Indo-Pacifique tracera la voie à suivre pour tirer parti de notre engagement dans la région et va poser les jalons de nos actions futures pour la prospérité de notre économie et pour notre sécurité et stabilité. If I go back to the first objective, the stability of the Indo-Pacific region is essential to global stability in general. As we are confronted with new threats at home, in the region, and in the digital sphere, our presence becomes all the more essential. We will do more to tackle foreign interference. We will increase our military presence and enhance our defense and security relationships with regional partners and allies. We'll continue to work hand-in-hand hand with ASEAN countries and its, of course, member states to ensure full respect for international law, including in the very important region of the South China Sea. As climate change redraws maritime routes and major countries look to the north, we'll continue to uphold our Arctic sovereignty and work with Arctic partners to ensure it is a region where peace and the rule of law prevail. When going to the second objective now, which is trade, we know that in a world increasingly shaped by tension, trade is not only an economic driver, but is also a geopolitical tool. We see this in emerging patterns of economic nationalism, protectionism, and economic coercion. 
Canadians are rightfully looking to the future and wonder and wondering whether good middle class jobs of the next generation, how these jobs will look like and whether they will have access to them. Ensuring our economic system is stable and positioning Canada for long term growth is in the interest of all Canadians. We have a comparative advantage. We are a member of the CPTPP and we're the only G7 country with a free trade agreement with all other G7 countries. And earlier this month, I was pleased to announce our intention to join the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, IPEF, a move that both the United States and Japan have stated their support. So thank you. Nous allons augmenter nos investissements en matière de défense et de sécurité dans la région et nous allons également investir nos énergies pour diversifier nos relations commerciales à travers l'Indo-Pacifique. I look forward to working with all of you in this room to seize the opportunities presented by the region and let me tell you, the world is waiting for us. The strategy is not only about what the government can do, it's what we can do all together because it will take all of us. I'm a pragmatic. This is not a moment to isolate ourselves. Our diplomatic legacy is one Canadians can be proud of, one that we must build on to meet the challenges of today, to be a reliable partner for the future. We must stand with our allies, and I would go even further. We need to broaden our coalition of states. Je suis une pragmatique. Et face au contexte mondial présentement, mon conseil suivant, ce n'est pas le temps de s'isoler. Notre héritage diplomatique, les Canadiens peuvent en être fiers, et c'est cette, sur cet héritage sur lequel nous devons aujourd'hui nous appuyer pour relever les défis devant nous et être un partenaire fiable dans l'avenir. For us to succeed, it will take hard work, humility and ambition. This moment demands a truly Canadian strategy. It demands the best of us. And Canada's best is its people. Thank you so much. This week uh, that CSIS has briefed the Prime Minister that there was uh, Chinese interference in the 2019 election through money and assistance to candidates across the political spectrum. Um, and we know that this happens from more than one country. Mm -hmm. right? But what should we be doing to make sure that our, our democracy is robust against democratic interference, or sorry, foreign interference in democratic elections? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and I know everything linked to democracy is of interest to you, Peter. Yeah. Um, well, listen, to be straightforward, we won't let any foreign actor meddle in our democracy, period. Uh, for the past two elections, we had a committee that was working on these very issues, and also we strengthened our processes, but I think we need to do more. And that's why I mentioned it in my speech, Peter, because indeed, we need to make sure that we tackle foreign interference at home, but I would say also particularly in the digital sphere. And I've had many conversations with my colleagues around the world about this, because this is a new challenge that we need to address per country, but also we need to address together. So there's, there's a lot of elements in, in this strategy. You've laid out, you've laid out five of them. Um, yep. We can go through them a little bit, um, but can you give us a sense of, of how the strategy that you've articulated differentiates from what we're doing now? What's mm -hmm. new? Mm -hmm. Well, many things. First, um, we will have a clear strategy rather than different initiatives. So right now we're working with nine departments all together to have a strong approach towards the Indo-Pacific. Because the problem Canada has been facing, and I see many of the consuls of different countries in the region, um, which you know they, they've been highlighting to me the, the issue of Canada not always being a reliable partner. Um, because sometimes we show up and then we leave and then we go back. That can be it. What we're doing right now is a reorientation of our foreign policy towards the Indo-Pacific. Of course, we'll continue to engage across the world. But this is extremely important. And since it is important, 
We want to make sure that it's a whole of government approach, but more than that, that it's a whole of society approach. Uh, and in terms of what will be different, well, I'll be sh you know, making different announcements and my colleagues will be making different announcements linked to five, mm -hmm. all the five pillars. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's, what's a, just, just so we can kind of peg it when we see it, what's, what's an example of where we've been un, unreliable? I mean, is it, is, it just a, is it just a function of us not having enough diplomatic resources or, or is, it, is, it, is it around trade agreements? I mean, wh where are our partners asking us to, to, you know, to step up more? Well, you know what? I think that for a long time, um, we saw uh, us as a very important transatlantic partner because we've invested a lot in our uh, relationship with Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously we have a very important relationship with the US and we work with them, uh, you know, obviously uh, on throughout the continent and the hemisphere and particularly also the Arctic. But we need to assert ourselves more as a Pacific nation. And so that is why um, the goal is to deepen our partnership in the North and Pacific uh, definitely with Japan and Korea. Uh, and at the same time, we will continue to work with our Five Eyes allies, uh, definitely Australia and New Zealand. And we want to make sure that we invest in the centrality of ASEAN and all the ASEAN countries. And so um, I'm looking forward to announcing the different strategy, but also to sharing details of it in the Indo-Pacific when I'm there starting tomorrow. That's great. Let me ask you, and I, I think we're all really looking forward to the, the strategy being rolled out. We know it's been a long time yep. that you've been pushing it and developing it in the, yep. in, in the department, and you've really drawn from across Canadian knowledge on, on this, which is a wonderful engagement. Including you, Peter. I, I, I have it help anytime we can. Mm -hmm. um, Jenna Stein, who everyone knows. Um, yeah, which we love. Always tells me, indeed, always tells me that domestic uh, foreign politics in Canada is domestic politics. So I want to talk about two aspects of this yep. and ask you about this. Um, you know, we have, a very, we have a very diverse country, obviously, and diasporic politics matter in our country. People mm -hmm. care about the politics of the country which they're from. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to hear how you think about developing foreign policy, which, if we put it in colloquial terms, is going to be tougher on China than it has been. It's a different orientation towards, towards India. What are the domestic challenges of, of, kind of executing a more robust foreign policy in this country? against I domestic politics? I think the fact that we have uh, people from all around the world living in Canada um, or that have roots to uh, different parts of the world is a, is a strength. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, people value in Canada our diversity. Uh, it was interesting to see the recent poll about the fact that Canadians support uh, um, immigration, which is not the case in many countries of yes. the world, yes. I must say. Um, so obviously we will be working with the different communities. I think that they're at the core of the solution because, and that's why I say yes, it's all about the government investing, but it's also about all the people investing because um, at the end of the day, doing business with uh, the region, with India, with ASEAN countries happens because people trust each other and basically they go into commercial agreements. Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes also um, to China, I think that um, we are having indeed a clear-eyed approach. But there's a hundred billion dollars worth of trade with mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. We know that. Uh, and so my job is basically to say that there is a geopolitical risk. Meanwhile, uh, respecting the independence of the business sector and engaging also with China on key issues. Mm -hmm. And I profoundly believe in diplomacy. And that's why I had many conversations with my counterpart, Wang Li. But we share concerns. We're not the only ones. Yes, the US has shared concerns, but also Japan has shared concerns. The G7, uh, you know, so European countries as well. Mm -hmm. And so our goal right now is to really double down on the respect of international norms. This has kept the, um, the peace and stability since the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So that's why it was important for us and for me to explain what will be our relationship with China and at the same time how much we will continue to um, 
uh, work with other countries around the world to make sure that these norms are respected. I've got, I want to follow on this, and it's a yeah. question that shows up in the cards as well. So you, uh, you didn't talk too much about the, the power projection part of, of this. You, you, we talked about Taiwan a little bit. But uh, something else that's happening in the region is the Quad, that the United States, yep. India, Japan, and Australia have, have uh, teamed up in a sense and, and, and created and a, India, yeah. in India, you know, created a body where the four of them are working together. Yep. A li little bit of this has to do with military procurement, but there's a, there's a, there's a strategy, a military strategy there as well. Um, what's, what's the role of Canada's uh, national defense in, in, in mm -hmm. supporting foreign policy in the, in, in the Indo-Pacific? So a couple of things. I'll answer your question in two, two ways. Sure. So there is indeed more minilaterals that you're seeing. So the Quad, AUKUS, etc. <clears throat> and as I mentioned at the beginning, Canada was not always seen as a reliable partner. So that's why we decided to do this Indo-Pacific strategy we joined the Partners of the Blue Pacific, which was an initiative which was launched by the US recently to support small island states in the Indo-Pacific. We uh, just uh, said that we would uh, want to join the IPEF, so thank you again to Japan, and thank you to the United States for supporting our bid. We hope that we can have the support of other countries represented by great people here tonight. Um, and at the same time, we will continue to engage even more uh, to reinforce ASEAN. Uh, definitely, we will want to become a strategic partner of ASEAN. When it comes to defense, I've already said that we would be increasing our investments in the defense and security uh, sector. We've done really important work recently. I was just, uh, you know, I spent Thanksgiving in Busan, Korea, on uh, the HMSC Vancouver, who's an important ship that had just gone through an important patrol mission yes. uh, linked to the UN Security Council uh, motion, well, re resolution on, um, on the DPRK. And at the same time, it had gone uh, through the Taiwan Strait uh, to uphold international norms relating to the Taiwan Strait. So we have Oper Operation Neon and Operation Projection in the region, but like I'm saying, our goal is actually to do more, and I'm working with the Minister of Defense on this issue. Thank you very much for that. Um, Did you choose the questions? Oh, I choose them. That's oh, it's, okay, it's, it's part of the power of being the director. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a, there's a whole good set of them here. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to ask you uh, whether the Indo-Pacific strategy will articulate what domestic industries and resources we're willing to protect from foreign ownership and from control? Well, indeed, I mentioned in the speech that we will put a national economic lens on foreign investments. Um, we've just announced that we would be doing so in the critical uh, minerals mm -hmm. uh, uh, sector. Uh, the Minister of Industry and the Minister of uh, Natural Resources just announced that two weeks ago, um, and there will be other sectors. At the same time, we want to do it along with uh, the business industry, well, the business sector. We want to make sure that it makes sense, mm -hmm. uh, that we are able to showcase uh, also that Canada is open to investment, but at the same time, we can't be naive. It does, so let's pursue this a little bit. Is that is that limited to, to Chinese purchase of critical mineral, minerals and resources? Or, or if BHP came along, would we say, or an Australian company or an Indian company, would we similarly say uh, we're holding on to those? So the Minister of Trade, uh, of Industry, sorry, will have more yeah. to say. Um, what we said on the critical mineral side is that uh, we would be um, uh, tackling uh, the issue of state-owned enterprises. Let me ask a question that's been, been posed by Phil Lipsy, who's the, the director of our uh, Center for the uh, for Global Japan, for Global Japan, mm -hmm. um, Hi, Phil. And, and Phil would like to know uh, how you see Canada's relationship with leading democracies in the region, in particular like Japan, South Korea, mm -hmm. and Taiwan. What are the key priorities when you're for this strategy, especially with democratic partners? Well, I was in Japan and South Korea recently. It was a very successful trip, um, and um, Japan will be hosting the G7 next year. So. Uh, I will be there a lot, many of uh, my colleagues will be there a lot, the Prime Minister will be there. Um, and I met with Prime Minister Kishida when I was in Japan also. And as for South Korea, 
Uh, well, President Yoon was in Canada. It was his first bilateral visit. Um, and our goal is really to deepen our relationship with Japan and South Korea in particular. Um, why? Because the Northern Pacific is our neighborhood. And we want to make sure that um, we uh, invest in Japan and Korea, that we uh, work together. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of business to do between our both countries. But also, we're like-minded, and it just makes sense mm -hmm. to work together. Um, so uh, I'll have more to say about uh, this very important relationship. But trust me, I'll be going to this part of the world a lot. So please say that to uh, your foreign ministers, because they will be caught seeing me a lot. So don't, don't Which doubt. I get along very well, very well with Yogi and PJ, my two counterparts. I'm, I'm I don't know about this, but I'm not sure we've ever had two uh, more frequently flying foreign ministers or ministers of international trade than you and Minister Ng, so you are everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Let me ask you a, fo a follow-up question on this. Very jet-lagged, but I, that's I okay. I bet you are. There are, at least two, <laughs> there are at least two parts of the strategy that relate to kind of democratization, yeah. the promotion of peace and, and prosperity. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine us pegging any of our trade agreements or other engagements to the democratic performance of our partners? India, for example, is, a, is an embattled democracy in some ways right now, right? It is working through some, some really tough issues domestically as a, as a democracy. Are, are we going to link up how countries are doing on things we care about, like human rights and democratization, with, their, with, with our trade agreements? I think, you know, we've done, through the CPTPP, a lot of work to make sure that it would become a progressive deal. And like I mentioned, we're the only G7 uh, country that has a trade deal with other G7 countries, but we want to broaden the coalition of states. I think more than ever, there is a, a battle for influence in the world. And we need to engage even when we disagree. We need to have tough conversations. But meanwhile, we indeed need to make sure that we have strong trade relations. We're a trading nation. We're 39 million people. But we are, you know, one of the most important economies in the world. But that also depends on how we engage and are able to trade. So I don't see this neither nor. I think we have to do both. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to India, uh, I've mentioned, yes, we have strong people-to-people -people ties. But at the same time, um, we need to address the question of human rights and minority rights. And we'll do so. I've had conversation with my colleague, Shekhar Shankar on this uh, very issue, and I will be seeing him next week, and we'll be talking about uh, yes, our Indo-Pacific strategy, our focus on India, which you know includes every single part of our relationship. And uh, talking about non-democracies in the region, because there are many we're going to be engaging with, or we do engage with. Of course, um, well, we engage yeah. with countries with different uh, systems of government around the world. Yeah. That has been the strength over the years. And yes. I think because there's more instability in the world, more than ever, we need to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So should our, should our trade engagement with China depend on its respect of human rights? On the question of China, I've told you what, mm -hmm. you know, it's been clearly highlighted. We need to engage at different levels, but China right now poses a geopolitical risk, and the business community needs to know it. So when you, um, let's, let's talk about the multilateral framework that you're going into, right? So mm -hmm. you know, speaking of travel, uh, you've got an incredible week coming up. You're going to, ASEAN, APEC is happening. You're going to the Francophonie, which in she Tunisia. has, yeah, yeah. which has, of course, a, uh, ha has an Asian tie-in as well. Actually, but it's okay. much bigger than that in North Africa and all those things. Yeah. What's the, what, what should Canada be doing differently than it's doing now or kind of enhancing what it's doing now to, to better project our influence in multilateral, in multilateral institutions? Well, I think Canada's influence is, is, is great mm -hmm. in multilateral uh, forms. I think that that's where we are extremely strong. Uh, and that's where our allies and partners and different countries of the world respect us. The issue right now is uh, we need to make sure that the international norms that underpins many of these international forums are respected. Mm -hmm. Because Canada not only has worked on, on, on these international norms. We've been the architect and sometimes the engineers of these norms. And we've benefited a lot from these norms. But we're not the only country, Peter, that has benefited from these norms. Many countries as well. I'm not saying this, these rules are perfect. We also need always 
to um, make sure that we uh, work on them. But at the end of the day, uh, this has kept us safe since yes. the Second World War. Yes. And as greater power competitioning is deepening, is increasing, well, we need to engage, we need to show up, we need to open doors. I'm not into door closing, mm -hmm. I must say, mm -hmm. I'm into opening doors. Yes, yes. Let me ask, uh, uh, let me shift gears just a, a little bit. It's not gonna go too far away from China, but let me just shift gears because we've yep. had a, a couple of questions here and, yep. and Joe Wong, our VP International is here, mm -hmm. and as importantly, the president of Toronto Metropolitan, mm -hmm. President Lashmi is here as well, and we're really, really <laughs> pleased to have him here. What is the role, you talked about broadening understanding uh, of Asia, so kind of a two-part yep. question, right? One is, what should universities be doing mm -hmm. to, to kind of enhance mm -hmm. Canadians' mm -hmm. understanding of Asia and of, and of China? Mm -hmm. And what's the, here at U of T and at TMU as well, I'm sure we care a lot about students coming to Canada yep. from China, from India, you touched, you touched upon yep. this, right? What's the role of that kind of exchange at the level of universities? Is it going to be enhanced in, in your mm -hmm. strategy? How should we be thinking about it? How do we manage? You know, not the risks in it, but how do we manage the making sure those relationships are very smooth? So two parts, yeah. right? universities in general yeah, yeah, and yeah. international students. Well, thank you, and great to see Mo here. <laughs> um, you know, when I say whole of government and whole of Canada, these aren't just not words. Mm -hmm. It's actually actions. What is also important for Canada's role in the world is the relationships that you all have, that we all have, with friends and families and counterparts in the world. So we more, more than ever, we need to engage, not only at the diplomatic level, but I would say all of the country. And so the goal is to make sure that yes, indeed, we deepen our relationship and how can I say? We deepen our knowledge on China. And yes, we will be uh, hiring new Canadian experts on China. Mm -hmm. So I, do, I think there are different students in the room, you know, so you know. Uh, but at the same time, we will be working to make sure that academics, mm -hmm. many of you working here or, you know, at other universities, um, are participating in the development of that knowledge. Because we want to make sure also that we reinstitute this relationship between academics in Canada and academics in the rest of the world, which was underfunded and cut years ago. And so my goal is to make sure that we use our, not only our dip diplomatic power, because I really think we're a diplomatic powerhouse, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but also our research power our business power, mm -hmm. our, you know, you were talking about communities, our community's power yeah. to reach out. Yeah. And this is really something that differentiates Canada from the rest of the world. Can I, let's follow up on diplomatic power. Yeah. Um, because there's a, there's a certain school of thought in Ottawa that, that we actually need to, to really bolster our diplomatic core that we need to, you know, you're talking about putting in Chinese particular knowledge within embassies, but just that we actually need to, to kind of renew global affairs and and bring more people through it. Many of our students go through it, but that we need to get more people through the department, and we need to project Canadian diplomatic power in more in more places. Do you do you see this as a resource challenge that, that we actually have to have more Canadian diplomats out there in the world, or is it or is it something else? Well, I think there, it is. Every an minister wants more for their department, but, <laughs> but what's your yeah? What's your um, thought? Yes, of course, I always want more for my department, but at the same time, I think this strategy will give more to. Mm -hmm. Not only the department, it's not about the department, it's about Canadians, it's about why we're doing things. So it is about to make sure that we have the right tools to defend our national interests. And our national interests will be linked to the future of the region. So it's just to be make, sh make sure that we're smart about it. Mm -hmm. And yes, indeed, Global Affairs needs to have well-resourced, um, um, uh, you know, tools, but at the same time, like I was saying, we have to open the windows. Mm -hmm. We have to reach out. Diploma, diplomats can't work, you know, in autarcy. They need to, they need to be able to have um, networks mm -hmm. 
of, of, of intelligence across the board. And that's why I said I, I was talking about the communities, the people, the, the, the business sector, the researchers. Yeah. I think also that lots of countries in the world, Peter, are asking themselves, how do we modernize our, democ uh, our diplomacy? Mm -hmm. The world has changed in the way it, it is organizing itself, particularly in the digital sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, China and, and other countries are testing multilateral um, uh, forums. Um, how can we make sure that we are, you know, uh, really understanding what are the power dynamics happening within these multilateral forms? So these are all questions that we are trying to solve through another uh, piece of work that I'm working on, which is called the future of diplomacy within global affairs. Uh, and I hope that the first report on this will be coming in the, in the next weeks. Let me ask you one more one more question, yeah. uh, if you would. Um, mm -hmm. This comes from the audience, and it's that along with other G7 countries, Canada recently announced its participation in the PGII. This is often seen as a competing alternative to China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative. What's, what's Canada's view on this? Well, we're investing like other G7 countries in infrastructure in the, the, in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, we've announced it uh, at the G7 uh, Leader Summit. Um, also, we are working bilaterally with many of these countries, and I would say also our pension funds have done great work, which is not necessarily always highlighted about being present in the country, particularly I would say India. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I talk about the business sector, I have in mind the pension funds, I have in mind also our banks, I have in mind many of our you know, powerhouses that are uh, in, in Canada that can invest. At the same time, we uh, will be in the strategy highlighting what will be the government tools to help them mitigate these risks and also make sure that uh, countries uh, in the region know where the resources and the funding are available. Because uh, they, at the end of the day, countries in the region need to have access to choices. And that's what we will be able to provide, Minister. I think you're. I think you're reluctant to to call anything the Jolie Doctrine. I think you're 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 <laughs> you're, a, you're a doer. I always start laughing. When you're, you're, well, 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 I said but, I'm a pragmatic. But this is a very ambitious strategy that you've outlined. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's going to seize Canada's focus on how we should deal and interact with the Indo-Pacific. So, what's the? It's, I said last question. I, I lied. The last question <laughs> is what if we look out five years from now, ten yeah. years from now? This is successful. What does it look like for Canada? How are things different um, in how Canada sees itself and places itself in the world and how people are seeing mm -hmm. us? Well, I think, you know, it will be, be Japan and, and South Korea saying, well, yes, Canada has showed up and it is a reliable partner and we have a trusted relationship. It will be about ASEAN countries saying, Canada's helping to keep the peace and stability in our region. It will be about Australia and New Zealand say, of course, our friend, partner, brother, <laughs> our sister, I don't know, Canada is uh, at the table and uh, we're able to continue to ensure uh, that there is economic prosperity for people in our country. I didn't think, Peter, when I was appointed a year ago that the question of peace and stability would be as much as a focus of my mandate. And I had this Indo-Pacific strategy to develop. And I decided to make sure that it would become a focus of not only, yes, Canada being a reliable partner in the region, but it would be a tool for us to make sure that indeed in five years, in 10 years, Canada will be that country that can help you know, bridge divides and ensure that at the end of the day, the people living on this planet have access to a better living for the next years. That's an inspiring vision. Uh, please join me in thanking the minister. Thank you. Minister, merci beaucoup. 
Thank you, Dr. Lowen. And on behalf of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to show up today. We have wonderful guests here with us. And uh, on behalf of um, Jeff Nankaville, our president and CEO, he is in Singapore right now. He just arrived last night and he's preparing for what Lisa uh, gave you a sneak peek about, um, about our big uh, Canada and Asia conference that's going to take place in Singapore in February 2023. So more to come on that. And again, many, many thanks. Yeah, thank Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy.